Good morning, Wyandot. Almost every time that we offer a Q&A, we receive questions about gender roles, typically in the form of what is the role of women in the church uh, or in the family or in society, and maybe more specifically, what is God's view, what does the Bible say about women and womanhood? Well, it's understandable that there would be questions like this. We live in a very critical culture. We question everything and every authority is held to account. And frankly, that's a good thing. The Bible has weathered that for centuries. This isn't new for people to ask difficult questions, tough questions. The Bible has held up against that kind of scrutiny for generations and generations. And so it's okay to ask those questions. And it's interesting too, that in our culture, we have this thread of, of victimhood, the celebration even of victimhood. And we'll leave no stone unturned to find someone else that's been wronged. Well, that's not hard to do in the history of humanity. It's, it's a story of people hurting one another. And certainly men hurting women has been a prominent part of that, but that's only part of the story because there's also a lot of men hurting men and women hurting women. I would argue that the story of mankind has been a story of people hurting people. That's a function of the fallen nature of humanity, that we hurt one another. And everyone's been shaped by this to some degree, but some people have been deeply affected by that hurt, that other people have wounded them seriously. And it's fair to come up with this question and say, now, wait a second, is Christianity going to remind me of that constantly? Is it going to keep me oppressed and enslaved and powerless? Well, that's a fair question. And it's important to note that Christianity allows people who do not have power, whether it's because of gender or being enslaved or whatever it may be, maybe they're foreigners in the land, it gives everybody a type of equality that wasn't found before. Think about where it's coming out of, out of the Middle East, where you have thousands of years of patriarchy and very dominant uh, cultural forces where men controlled everything, the fathers and the husbands controlled everything. And yet in Christianity, a woman doesn't have to ask her father's permission to become a Christian, to follow Jesus. A woman's eternal destiny does not rest in the hands of her husband's religious decisions. A man or a woman, slave or free, Jew or Gentile, Everyone can approach God through Jesus Christ equally. And that's not just something that we go now with our modern sensibilities or read back into Christianity from 2,000 years ago. You could see the effect of that in those first few centuries because while Christianity spread through the Roman Empire, a lot of people resisted it and Christianity was persecuted for generations, but yet you see women and slaves and people on the fringes of society swell the ranks of the church because they found in the gospel message of Jesus Christ freedom and equality that wasn't found out in the world. And so Christianity introduces a type of equality, a type of feminism that you just don't find naturally where might makes right and frankly men are bigger and stronger and testosterone is that extra boost that, that keeps men physically dominant over women. But Christianity says no, all may come and all are loved by God, and all can receive the free grace of Jesus Christ. So you have this gender equality in Christianity, and I would argue it actually goes back further than that. You go all the way back into Judaism, all the way back to the story of Genesis and creation, where God made man both male and female that mankind was created, male and female, that was built into them, that it's sacred that they are created either male or female. And that gender, your gender, is just as sacred as your race or ethnicity. God did not make a mistake if he made you Italian or Ethiopian or Native American. He didn't make a mistake. That's not something to be ashamed of and to hide or to try to change about yourself. 
And he did not make a mistake when he made you a boy or a girl. That's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to hide. It's not something that has to be corrected. He didn't make mistakes, and you are not a mistake. But people hurt us, and that hurt affects us. It introduces shame and guilt in places it shouldn't be. And, and, and a lot of times people do want to change who and what they are, and they get confused about who and what they are. And, and this effect, not from God, but of human sin, this effect has two big casualties. Well, first is femininity. Uh, femininity, the noble and graceful qualities of womanhood, gets squelched. In fact, it's kind of hard to find in our culture. Uh, a lot of people who uh, feel called to be a stay-at-home mom complain about the criticism they get from other women, that somehow they've betrayed their gender because they're nurturing their own children. And while that's not a path for everyone at all times in every season, it's, it's strange how those very feminine qualities are not accepted. And instead, femininity kind of gets squeezed to opposite ends, both, both of which point to the worst of, of men's traits. Uh, you either have women to, to be a, you know, a fully actualized and, and powerful woman today, they have to imitate the foul-mouthed and vulgar sensibilities of men. And, and you know, why? I mean, man, you're, you're doing an imitation of the worst traits of men to be a woman. Or, or it's pushed all the way to the other extreme. And to be a powerful woman today, you have to be overtly sexual and pole dance at Super Bowls and that kind of thing. It, it's, it, again, it's catering in both cases, either imitating or catering to the worst traits of masculinity. That's not femininity. That, that, is, that is the squelching of femininity. But that's not the only casualty. The other casualty, you can guess, is masculinity. You think, well, man, if women either have to imitate men or cater to the tastes of men, then boy, men must be on top. Well, not exactly. You see, there's this thing called toxic masculinity. And the term toxic masculinity, it's actually been around for like 30 or 40 years, but it really became popular in just the last 10. And, and it's been defined as all traditional notions of masculinity are toxic. More specifically, the expectation that boys or men be active, aggressive, tough, daring, and dominant is toxic. Those things are toxic. It would be better for a boy to be passive, weak, fragile, cowardly, and timid. I don't accept that this toxic masculinity applies to all things male. I don't think that's true. I don't think that holds water in our, just our day-to-day -day experience. I don't think that's good for society. And I certainly don't think that's what the Bible teaches. Being masculine is not automatically, automatically toxic. Although if being masculine is bad for men, but being feminine is bad for women, is it any wonder why we have so much confusion? about gender and sex in our society right now. I mean, if that's what we're being taught, if that's the conclusions that we as a culture are coming up with, it's not biblical, it's not healthy. And I think personally, I believe it drives the rates of depression and suicide and confusion that our, that's plaguing our society right now. And so, toxic masculinity, being masculine is not automatically toxic. But let me tell you, humans can be toxic. Absolutely. It's not that toxicity doesn't exist. It absolutely exists. And the Bible has a word for it. It's called sin. 
And, and the Bible has been ahead of this conversation by thousands of years. It was talking about this, you know, 2,000 years ago, that it's sin that is toxic. And every time you find a real example, not competition and self-reliance and assertiveness that you find uh, maybe a little bit more commonly in boys than girls, that, that, is, that is not the toxic qualities. It's the abuse and neglect and harm that's done. It's the violence and the selfishness and the backbiting and the slander. Those things are what's toxic. And so the Bible speaks quite a bit about it. And you say, oh, well, again, that's just a Christian thing. And again, I'll take you all the way back to Genesis. Go back this time to Genesis chapter 3. And you have the story of Adam and Eve really sinning for the first time. And a lot of people single this out and say, well, now look at this. The serpent, here this crafty creature, uh, the serpent tempts Eve and Eve fails. Ah, it's women's fault. Ah, see, that's, that's the mistake. But I want to point to you where Adam fails. You see, there is a kind of toxic masculinity. There's a toxicity that happens when men fail, when men turn to sin and to selfishness, and they do not live up to that aspiration in their heart to be the, the, the brave protector, to, to be the one that stands up and leads and does the right thing and speaks up for what's true, even if it's not what they want. They speak up for what's true. That thing that God put in the hearts of men, when it's shunned, when it's ignored, everybody gets hurt. And women, especially, they, they, they fall to this. And so Eve is blamed, you know, oh yeah, Eve got suckered into this. Well, let me just ask the question, where was Adam? Okay, Adam, whose name means the man, all right? He, he's the man. So, so where is this hero protector? Where is Adam when the serpent is telling Eve that the fruit of this tree of knowledge of good and evil, this, this fruit that God said, do not eat of it, eat of it or you'll die. What, what, what'll happen here? You know, what, what, what are, well, this temptation is being put in front of Eve. Where is Adam? Well, Genesis chapter three, Verse six, it says, the woman saw the fruit of the tree was good for food and was pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom. And so she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. He's standing there listening to all of this. And yes, the serpent may have been talking to Eve, but Adam was with her. He was right there and said nothing. He didn't protect her from this temptation. He didn't step up and say, now, wait a second, maybe we should reconsider. He was just as greedy for gaining wisdom as Eve was. He could have said something and he didn't. Instead, he passively plays along and lets her, in this very cowardly way, lets, lets her take the first step while he's standing right there. And then she turns and gives some to him and he protects also. Uh, so this, this destroys things, right? The eyes of both of them were opened. They realized they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse eight, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of day and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So again, more fear and cowardice coming up. Where's that brave heart? Where's that, where's that confidence that Adam is supposed to have. It's not there. He's being a coward. But the Lord God called to man and said, where are you? He said, I'm, he said, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree? I commanded you not to eat from. And the man does this weak and selfish thing. He says, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit of the tree and I ate it. What a coward. What, passing the buck, blaming someone else. He was there. He could have intervened. He could have stopped it. Instead, he participated. He went along. When he realized he was wrong to have done what he did, he hid. And when he hid he, and was found, he then, he then 
passes the buck and blames someone else. As he would understand it from the context, it would seem that eating from the tree could mean that they might die right then and there. So he's saying, yeah, kill her. It's her fault. This kind of wickedness is not what men are called to. And yet the Bible is not afraid to show men in their wickedness hurting women. It, it, the Bible shows all kinds of, of sexual abuse and rape and violence toward women over and over again. And it never endorses it. It shows that men, when they turn away from the paths of God, are wicked and evil and need a Savior. And so that Savior comes, and Jesus Christ then is our example of manhood. He's our example, really, of, of how to live as a human being, male or female. He becomes this perfect example, and he saves us. He comes, he comes and delivers us in a way that, that, that we can't find anywhere else. He saves us from sin, and he gives us a new life. But men often hear that. And whether they're hearing that directly or indirectly, I think men evaluate church and they say, yeah, church. Yeah, church means that as a man, I need to be tamed and domesticated, quiet and weak. And I don't think I want to do the church thing. If you've ever noticed, churches are almost always statistically, uh, there's a higher percentage of women than men. And some of that I think people get more religious as they get older and women live longer than men. I think that's part of, the, part of the reason right there. But it's been interpreted as, oh, the church is feminine. The church is, is a thing for girls. And as a guy, I don't know if I want to be part of that. Well, let me tell you, Scripture holds up masculinity as something that God made and put in the heart of men. And it is a good and noble thing. Just like there's a good and noble and grace, graceful womanhood, there's a good and noble and strong manhood. I like the verse in 1 Corinthians 16. It's uh, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. It says, be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, and be strong. Now, Reading that at NIV, you may not catch what I caught. I actually knew it in the King James where it says, quit ye like men. I don't even know what that says. English has changed a lot in 400 years, but it means act like men. That word for be courageous means to act like men. In fact, you see that in the ESV and in the NASB. It actually says act like men. And in the original Greek, that word means show manly qualities. Well, the very next word says to be strong, and so we rightly translate this, and most of our translations, be courageous. It is a manly quality to be courageous, and the Bible encourages you to do that. And listen to that whole sentence again, now thinking in terms of manliness. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. If you're going to be a man who is a good husband and a good father, you're going to need all of these things. You're going to have to be on your guard because a thousand other influences are coming in to steal the minds of your family. And you need to stand firm in the faith because there's a thousand ways that we can get distracted and we can deviate from the true gospel message. And we're going to have to be courageous and strong. We're going to have to act like men. And it's something that God put into men to put into families to help with the up, you know, to bringing up and raising children we need this courage and the strength that is, at times, specifically masculine. I think that the message, though, that we find in Jesus Christ to find freedom from our sin that is so toxic and so destructive, this message through Jesus Christ, this forgiveness that we get through him by him dying on the cross and paying for our sins, this very brave thing that he did, is a message for men and women. And that's why I go back to a verse like Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, 
to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Where in that, to act justly, love mercy, to not punish people in the way they deserve, and to walk humbly with God, where in that is there room for chauvinism? Where in that is there, where in that is there room for, for racism or neglect or abuse or violence? Where? It's not there. And so the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, but especially the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, calls us to come out of our sin, the sin that is inherent in all human relationships, and to live a life set free. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you for making me exactly as I am. Lord, I thank you, though, that with the other sin and brokenness that have come in and polluted me and affected me and hurt me, that you don't leave me exactly as I am, that you rescue me through the gospel of Jesus Christ to make me whole and healed. Lord, we thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.